Hello, Patrick. Hello, hello. <laughs> so you don't have your cup of coffee with you. I, I just realized uh, before we went live. I agreed. Um, I think was it two o'clock now where I'm in Lithuania. And I think by this time of day, I've had one or two double espressos and I try and think, okay, let's have a tea, let's have a water, something like that. Um, and I think I'm always talking all day. So I've found my need for water uh, has gone up massively. So it's water and productivity more than coffee and productivity, but it's, <laughs> it still works. I'm curious, why double espresso? Um, it's just, I, I don't know, it's what I like. I think it, it sort of works back from you have a um, flat white, something like that. And so you go to a coffee shop, have a flat white. And then when you have your own coffee machine, it tends to try and make your own coffee. It's like, it just doesn't seem like the shop. So you, you get rid of the milk. It's like, I'll just have the double espresso where you can press the button. Um, there has been one thing though I've been trying, which has been really nice. So I read a blog about um, putting more cinnamon in, in your coffee and putting more cream in your coffee instead of milk. So the, the article was about um, how if you're drinking even almond milk, so I don't like dairy, but if you drink almond milk, it still spikes your insulin levels a little bit. So what I was saying was if you drink um, like a, a espresso with water, put some cinnamon in and put some cream, it really curbs your appetite, but still um, is a good coffee. So I've been doing that recently and I've lost a little bit of weight whilst not snacking. So I, I think it's quite nice, um, but that's that's what I do if I can drink at home. I'm a big fan of uh, the very common usual cafe latte. Yeah. So that that's my thing. Usually when you go to Starbucks or Costa, they <laughs> ask you. Oh, the, the big fat ones, the, the tall ones. The tall ones. Uh, but yeah. I don't want to add anything on top of it. Like they will usually ask you, would you like to have some, you know, caramel, hazelnut, like some of those kind of things. Yeah. Sugar. No, nothing. I, I just li uh, like. What it. about dairy though? Are you Are you a dairy fan or do you stay away from it? I'm, I'm trying to drink. I'm trying to drink more the nuts-based uh, milk. Yeah, but uh, I am not uh, completely, you know, off the diary. Yeah. So it's it's, uh, it's it's a strange one. I think um, I should have one of those tests where they test your allergies or test different things because I've not had it. But I know anytime I drink milk, I just sort of whoa, that doesn't feel quite right. So I think the past year I've been on um, almond milk and coconut milk and all these different things. But coffees definitely suck in terms of the taste compared to like a full fat Starbucks latte with caramel and everything. Um, but I, I think the, the, the businesses that we're both in, you need something of that coffee like to get you going. But I think the other thing is I like the routine. I think there's, I know what parts of the day it is based on when I'm having a coffee. So like, half seven, eight o'clock is my first coffee. Then I know I've done a good sprint of work and 11, I stop for coffee, different things. And then one, I'll have like a tea or something. And then 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I'll have a glass of wine. So there's like different milestones that that's the, like the, the tick in my brain is in, keep going. You're doing well. There's the, you've hit the second coffee, you've hit the tea, you've hit the wine. It's relaxed time. <laughs> like there's different drinks in my day that do that. Cause I, I think when you yeah, when you're eating, um, particularly lunchtime, it gets so heavy and tired that like I just like eating quick anyway. So um, I tend to really value a drink, whereas food, it's just like fuel during the day. At the weekend, I love food, but during the day, I don't think I'm going to have a really great lunch. It's like, what's the quickest way to fuel me for the rest of the day? Uh, that's how I tend to look at it. Amazing. Patrick, after this coffee run, by the way, I'm having my espresso from a special specialty coffee shop. So it's really, yeah. really nice. Uh, but after this coffee run, let's med, maybe introduce <laughs> yourself to the audience. Oh, they don't need to know who I am. Just talk coffee. They, nobody cares who I am. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, everybody who's tuning in today, live or <laughs> listening to the, to the podcast, uh, I'm here with my friend uh, Patrick Collins, who is the head of growth of Startup Wise Guys. And he's also a growth hacker, an expert in B2B sales and the founder of Prospect Labs, among other things. And generally a really, really productivity biased kind of person that I always have very interesting uh, efficiency based conversations around. But Patrick, why don't you introduce yourself, emphasizing a little bit about uh, yeah. your background, your story, and why you're excited to do what you're doing today? Of course. So you'll think I'm going back too far, but don't worry, this is not a huge background. But the reason I am who I am because of my parents and my surrounding family. So my mother is a language teacher, very, very creative and always been self-employed. So 
part of my brain is all about creativity, new ideas, um, interpersonal skills, and getting to know other people. My father, um, he's retired now, but he was a quality control engineer. He's the sort of person who didn't go the military, but his socks are lined up in a row, pants are lined up in a row, clothes are color coordinate in a row. So uh, what I got from him on the other side of my brain was the attention to detail and the tidiness. And so when you jumble them all together, you create me, which is a person who a lot of people joke about saying I'm the ideas man. And basically a startup comes to me and will say, have this problem, how do I do it? And very quickly I can come up with plans of how to help them sell. But also I'm the very obsessive tidy person to say there's no idea without a foundation of tidiness. So my whole outlook on life is if you want to be creative, get your systems in place that you can start from and then really, really blow up. But a lot of people um, tend to just start with creative and can't maintain it. It just goes everywhere. So a bit about me. Um, I've had a really sort of mixed career. I was a professional footballer from probably age 15 to 23. Um, some would say luck. Some would say, well, you deserved it. But I didn't grow up saying I'm going to be a footballer. I was a, a privately educated uh, child going to school, ready for university. And then at 15, I had trials for a club, trials for another club signed professional and then about six months later I was on the England team so I went from like playing with my friends on a Sunday messing about to marking Ronaldo six months later in Portugal so it was totally crazy of like this transition of this was amazing um one of the curses was for football though was I had a brain so I had like seven years of playing professional football I had a, a good career not amazing but good career in different levels but everything in my head was always I wonder what I could create what I could build what I could do Whereas my friends would just finish training and be like, I will just play computer games or something. So my my whole psyche of how I want to be as a person didn't really match with being a footballer. So I had a career and then I finished and sort of got the chance to start another life again at the age of 24, 25. Whereas I see a lot of my friends retiring at 35 sort of thinking, well, what do I do now? I haven't got any education. I've got no professional skills, that sort of thing. So I got a chance to have a football career and then start and I remember finishing football, I did these sort of steps. I went straight to the bank, took out a loan because I could because I had a great uh, like track record of being a footballer. And if you went to a bank in early 2000s, I think in the UK and said you're a footballer, they just say, how much money do you want? It was crazy. So I took out a loan, um, I bought a, a house and then I thought, okay, well, I've got a house now. What do I actually do with my life? And I started looking into teaching jobs, different things. And I saw an advert on Gumtree um, in the UK, like a, a classified ads channel. And it just said, a really cool job, work for easy startup, pick your hours, loads of free beers. So that was the ad. And so I went for an interview and it was basically a really early stage startup on an accelerator. The marketing guy just posted for somebody. I went, uh, went for the interview and, and got the job. And so my path could have gone anywhere, but the first ever job I looked at and applied for was within a startup, within an accelerator. And so that job was like a year of just figuring out how to build a business really. And that was a long time ago, but that development was from working with part of an accelerator for startups, then developing into having my own agencies and then working on softwares and different things. But I've only ever been in the startup environment. So I've never had a corporate job. I've never been employed outside of the startup world. So 10, 11 years, something like that has been all anything to do with startups. That's what I do. Um, and I think it's this mix of being able to be creative, but also you need a structure to say what investment are you getting, where you're heading, where you're growing, that sort of thing. But there's the the crazy flexibleness that I need in my life that um, I can still have the ideas and test things that doesn't stop me to one thing. So a lot of different mix. But what's brought me to where I am today, which is head of growth at Startup Wise Guys, is a dream job for me because um, my role is basically help as many startups as I can get through the, the tough time of getting your first 50 customers first 100 customers something like that um and then that's that's what i do on a daily basis today i've done three hours of work webinars to teams across the world on how to close deals how to find people on linkedin little bits but have a profound impact when you start building it up and building that um so it, it leaves me to where i am now very happy living in lithuania working with a lot of baltic teams and getting the chance to do things like this and then meeting yourself where um, we've worked together for, I, I don't know, first time maybe two, three years ago, but never had this chance to to one-on-one -on -one have a chat. Yeah, it's, it's mainly been 
we talk about business and how do we do this workshop and how do we <laughs> inspire and empower these startup teams and so on. So, so it's great to have you here and actually yeah. hear more about your story. And you mentioned that you're head of growth. What does it mean for somebody to be head of growth? Like what are some of the responsibilities that you're you're having? Maybe share with the audience. It'll be interesting. Yeah. To hear. I'm not too sure. <laughs> like, so it's a funny one. So Christopher, the founder of Start Wise Guys, the, the situation happened. So last March time, COVID, I was running a, a lead generation agency. So startups would message me, say, we, we want to do these things as sales. Can you set it up for us? COVID hit. And very quickly, I picked up the phone to a friend who'd invest in Estonia. And I just said, what's the plan? And he just said, downsize, cut budgets, don't spend money. We're screwed for about a year. And I said, OK, good advice. So I ignored his advice, and for a month, I had the passion to say, this is not going to affect us. I don't care. We're going to sell. We're going to keep going. And then I just realized, actually, this isn't the way to go. I think I want to scale down. Um, my wife was pregnant at the time. We're due to have a baby. I thought, the world's going so much crazy. I need to scale down a bit and figure out what I want to do. Um, and so I scaled down the agency to down from, I think, eight staff down to one staff, helped them to get jobs elsewhere. And then I just thought, OK, I need a bit of a change. And it was that time, Christopher, uh, um, the CEO of Start Wise Guys got in touch and said, well, you work a lot as an external coach. Do you want to join the team? And I was always been desperate to do that because I would come in and do one session, um, love it, and then leave and be like, but I care about these teams. Like, I, I want to know how they're doing. I want to progress. And even the Wise Guys uh, team as, a, as individuals are wonderful people that I thought that's the first time I felt welcome as an environment as a real like employee, because I'm very unemployable and I've been told that, but this is the like the first company that's actually found a way to adapt to employ me. And pretty much my role, they leave me to it. They, they know that if they micromanage me, it's not my personality. So they give me big projects and have to plan. But my, my whole remit of head of growth is I want, and it was the title I made up. So I don't think it's a title that is necessarily to corporate or means anything as such. But I, I wanted it to be something about, I want to be the person that's pushing everyone to say every day, we need to do more. We need to be testing stuff. We need to be thinking big. We need to be planning everything. And so within Wise Guys, most of my roles are working with the programs. So I need to be working with the teams and keeping them on track with sales. But I also want to be coming up with ideas every day. Most of them they don't listen to, but some they say, amazing, let's do it. But I like to have that opportunity that I can share these ideas to say, can we help grow this business? So I think head of growth is a bit of a, a nonsense title, but it's just something that I thought if I'm going to have a title for once and not be founder, I want to enjoy it. So that's it really. But I, I don't think anybody selling to head of growth people, I'm not even sure what the title is meant to mean, but that's what it means to me. I think it's a really cool title, first of all. And secondly, shout out to Startup Wise Guys. It's been really a, an amazing journey being part of the, the Startup Wise Guys family now since uh, 2016. Amazing people. Really, the, the programs are really, really good. And, and Patrick, I got to say, the first time I saw you, I, I think it was in Vilnius. It was the FinTech batch. And yeah. you just came in, started... My workshop, before my workshop, you just came in and, and you gave uh, the, the startups a little bit of a tough love because there were some Ooh. of them that were, that were, I remember that. <laughs> some of them that were, I think, a little late for the meeting, yeah, yeah. were not prepared, they didn't know. And you just gave them this really cool 10 minute kind of a pet talk to, to really get them in place. And I think, yeah, I really appreciate the fact that you really care. And uh, talking about startups, I want to just uh, start with this topic. Why should uh, startups uh, consider growth hacking strategies and, and invest yeah. the time to... Uh, and what, what does that really mean? Where they should start? If somebody has never done anything with growth hacking, a founder who is listening to this, this podcast right now, where should yeah. they start in terms of this? So there's a mix of things. I think I'm quite unique because you'll find you have people on the spectrum of hardcore sales. So they want to do cold calling, emailing, LinkedIn proactive and then you have the other side that will say the more the 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 social content the brand strategist the podcast the webinars the i don't know lots of content i would say i'm bang in the middle where um i want to promote both sides of both and i see the, the value in both um i think one thing that's really important is with any startup before they're thinking of growth hacking lead generation automation any of the the buzzwords we'll explain in a second 
they need to understand the context of what sales is. And a lot of people get this wrong. Um, sales is building a relationship with a stranger that has a problem and you are the solution. And that's simply it. So, so many people, when they look at sales, they'll look at things like, how do we push things in front of them? How do we message them? How do we email them? But they don't think the one thing, which is how can I help this person? So all of my sales, all of my lead generation strategy, even if it's automated, is if this person replies and is positive, I'll do what I can to help. So one example, I had a strategy. I was messaging somebody, and somebody from Nigeria replied and said, thanks, your software's not for me. And I said, no problem. What's it like for you there? Like, I got really interested to say, what's it like with COVID? What's things happening? And he said, oh, it's tough now. I've lost my job. So I said, well, let me know what you need help. Can I make introductions? But I wasn't selling anything. But my whole mantra in life is, can you help people build this ecosystem where you're connected to lots of people? And it comes back so much. So I think before you go into growth hacking, you need to know what your moral compass is for what you actually want to achieve with sales. And if your target is simply selling, people come and people go. If you can sell more of a dream, sell more of a relationship, sell more of a we're here to help you, then people buy into the person behind the company as well. And I think I do this example a lot, but there's a software we might chat about later for email called Superhuman that I use. And it's got hundreds of millions of investment, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of customers. Scroll to the bottom and it's got the three founders on the face, uh, on the page. And they say, no matter how big we are, you should still know who we are and who's the people behind the company. And so a lot of early stage startups try and look too big and they don't even say who's the team behind. So I think it's very, very important when you're looking at sales, it's all about building relationships, helping somebody, getting to know them, and then you start selling when you can offer something. So when you go into this point of growth hacking or automation, to me, growth hacking automation is about being lazy. So I would say I'm lazy. If I have to do something manually repeatedly, why would I? There's a smarter way to do that. So I'm constantly looking at something as soon as I say a formula and then I automate crazy. So if I can write a LinkedIn message and not get 100%, but if I can get 50% of people accepting, I'll just repeat that message automated all the time. So growth hacking is to get, if you think of efficiency and effectiveness, it's a mix of both. It's how do you do things that are both efficient and how they run and effectiveness of the results. One of the problems with growth hacking is people will see a webinar, find a tool and try and automate everything. Highly efficient, but the effectiveness is terrible because what they actually say. So the, they automate everything and say, hey, let's connect, book a demo, sign up now. So the efficiency of sending a 1,000 messages is awesome, but nobody signs up. So you need to think efficiency is automation, effectiveness is human touch. How do you, how do you get that person with you resonate and think, yeah, I'll connect, or yeah, I'll have a chat, or I'll get to know them? Don't need to blow them away and make sure they're amazing, but how do you feel like that little touch is a bit better? So I think within um, growth hacking, there's a lot of people that go into this too hardcore. Growth hacking is basically finding a way that has a bigger impact than if you were to do it manually. Growth hacking on LinkedIn would be use an automation tool that sends a thousand messages a month in the background whilst you're not doing anything, or email messages are going out, a uh, chatbot on your website. It's a scaling up your output with keeping things quality. Um, so I think that that should solve it, but a lot of people tend to um, get very carried away and overexcited about automation and growth hacking, and they don't even try the manual. So I use the analogy a lot of driving a car. A lot of people say, how do I automate a uh, thousand messages a month? And I'm like, okay, so do you drive a Formula One car at the moment? No, you need to drive a really crappy car, you get used to it, then you get a better car, then you go full speed and you take off. But you don't start lessons in a full speed car. So the same with automation, you start manually, you send 20 messages a day, people start a reply, you speed it up and you think, I have a formula, automate, and then it's rocket. So I, a final bit on this, I had one person who say, um, we had a chat and his, his strategy was saying is gonna be crawl, walk, run. And I said, it's more like crawl, walk, explosion or crawl, walk, rocket to something like that. Because it goes from, you're not too sure, you speed up a bit and then you explode with the automation. But if you start with rocket, you go and you explode, it doesn't work. So it's sort of getting the manual right, finding a formula, and then you look into the growth hacking sides of things. You know, it really reminds me uh, of um, the thing I do with productivity and teaching people how to be more productive, to, to be, become masters of time management in many ways. And usually people come and they are like, what tool should I use? 
what software like mm. look we'll go we'll get to the software start writing a to-do list on your this thing yeah, yeah. Start writing a to-do list on the on the on the spreadsheet and create it as a habit let's yeah. master the basics on paper now that you're in a place that it's not enough for you you need to optimize because you feel there's more space for improvement and you can only do it with a software let's get there yeah. but firstly we need to cover the basics pretty much yeah. like what you are saying with the other but, things like you know send, I, send 20 messages right yeah, yeah see what works you see what doesn't <laughs> work before you start automating it makes sense to actually see what works and you focus on effectiveness and then at some point we can also think about efficiency yeah i i totally agree the um it's tricky for people because i think they exchange software for motivation they sort of think well i want loads of results i can't really be bothered to buy into it so i can automate it and they'll come and it's like no you have motivation then a pattern then the software and it comes so I've been capable of this myself. So I can be very good at sales and organizing on my admin projects. But at the moment, I'm trying to learn Lithuanian. And so instantly, is there an app? Is there something? And it's like, I need to just knuckle down, like learn 100 words, learn 100 phrases, then maybe get lessons and teachers and things. But I've been capable the past couple of years of thinking there's a quick way to learn languages. So I'm, I'm English. I'm naturally a lazy learner. Like, who needs a language? I'm English. So that's the problem. You need to, like, it's not ingrained with me that I have to learn other languages. And being in Lithuania, having a, a one-year-old baby, um, I should be learning Lithuanian. I think it's important to, to speak. And so trying to learn, I instantly thought, uh, is there Duolingo? There wasn't. Is there an app? And just thinking that if I can play a game, I'll learn. And you've got to do the hard work. So... I think any of these things, language, sales, lead generation, comes from practicing the hard work, getting organized, and then finding a way to speed up. But you can't exchange results for automation without a context of what to do. So a lot of people I train seem to think they can automate, and they don't even know who the target audience is. So they're just messaging everybody with different responses. And so the manual bit is you call 20 people and say, what do you think of my product? And you find that there's a certain niche that love it, so you automate to hundreds of them, but not just spread and fire sort of thing. And you mentioned something um, which I think is, I would like to emphasize a little bit on when it comes to sales, it's about solving problems and focusing on long-term relationship, which is one of the core values actually of Startup Wise Guys. And that really attracts me to it is we are in for the long run. And yeah. if you can maybe... Talk to me a little bit about this when it comes to sales, specifically B2B sales, because there are so many, mm -hmm. probably you have a lot of these messages yourself. I'm, I'm getting a few messages per day from yeah. SaaS companies, which are trying to marry me on the first uh, time they see me. Yeah. They just come with the, we are a SaaS company, we can maximize mm -hmm. your sales, buy us. Yeah, yeah. Like, of course, you're going to just close the message, delete, unsubscribe, never see them again. But talk to me a little bit about this yeah um, because the, maybe these guys were sending a thousand messages per day or per month yeah. right so they have the efficiency but the problem is probably the results are not going to be what they were looking for right so, so yeah, talk yeah. To me about the long-term perspective so there's a few things there's long-term in terms of um startups and there's long-term in terms of sales so we look at startups first of all um any startup um it's funny i see a range of startups and one of the questions i say to them is how can you be bothered to run this business for the next nine years? And they say, well, what do you mean nine years? And I say, well, startup will get investment, you'll grow. But on average, it takes nine years for business to exit. So are you really going to pay or build this app for the next nine years and be motivated about it to say this is going to change the world? Why are you bothered? So I found my tolerance to terrible ideas is much more blunt now because I want to just say, don't waste your time. Don't spend the next year doing this because it's not the next year. If you're going to do this, it's the next nine years of your life. So on that thing, it was a very funny. Somebody showed me a clip and they were saying um, early startups should always be thinking of ABC and the Glen Gary Glen Ross is the always be closing. But he said, no, 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 it's ABC. Always be calling your partner to say, I'm working late. I'll not be home for dinner. <laughs> like, just forgive me. <laughs> so any startup should think ABC, always be calling and apologizing to your family that you're working late. Uh, but I think going back to this long-term strategy, 
on average, a business exits after about nine years. So if you think about Startup Wise, guys, a lot of people come in the accelerator and they'll message me and say, really looking forward to the session next week. Um, can I get some of your time? And my response is, of course, but I'm here for the next nine years, not the next month of the program. So a lot of the teams need to be thinking longer term of the foundations, the learning, the development. And what I found more and more with working with Startwise guys is you need to push a lot of the teams to be thinking bigger, thinking, I'm doing this workshop with, with you, for example, not about how this affects me now, but how do I have a company of 50 that implement these strategies? And that's where they need to be thinking the next step all the time. So in terms of long term, um, I think startups need to be thinking nine years ahead. And am I building this for a quick win, a quick exit? Because it doesn't really happen. It can do, but in general, it's a long slog. It's not um, so sort of spectacular. It's hustle and grow all the time. So I've got a very good friend I was speaking to, and he joined a company called Zendesk Cell. Um, it was called Base CRM at the time. He joined as the first non-technical founder, and then he was there for about 10 years, and then he sold for a couple of hundred million. And I was chatting to him about his progress, and he said it's not this hockey growth curve of just success. It was just like, it was just a horrible grind every day for 10 years, and then we sold the business. So he said there was some big wins and things, but like every day almost, he had on his wall, here's the targets, here's what we're doing. And they would hit them and say, okay, here's the next targets. So it's little small bit of action and grind all the time. In terms of lead generation or sales, in terms of building relationships, um, it's hard because even if you write the most manual personalized message, that can come across as too salesy. So if I spend 10 minutes researching your LinkedIn profile, looking about where you're from, who you've worked with, what you're passionate about, and connect about that, it might come across as a bit crazy, like, are you really trying to sell me something because you've sent so much? So one of the things I recommend to a lot of people is don't think too much about the connection message. Just be warm. Um, hey, Stian, I really love what you're doing um, on your shows. Would love to connect and learn more. That's it. Don't sell lots. Then when people accept the connection and they follow up, just say, um, thanks for connecting. Would love to know how you are doing these things at the moment. So if I was selling podcast equipment, I had a look at your podcast, would love to know what equipment do you do to record things? Because I can't sell you something if I don't know what you're looking to buy. And if you open up and say, I use this Sony microphone, I should be an expert at knowing every microphone out there, why that Sony one is amazing, but why the other ones are better and why our one we're pushing is a better for you. But I think a lot of the long-term relationships is trying to say to somebody, what are you doing at the moment? Can I add value? So there's a bit of an email template that I've seen that works very well, where you send people just saying, um, I'm speaking to a few companies, showing them how to do these techniques. Um, I would love to show you how it's affected other companies. Have you got 30 minutes just to explain? And the idea is not trying to sell, but say, can I educate you on the space, which is my obsession, that I can maybe help you? So even last night, I did a demo in the start of the call. I said, with a bit of luck, you'll sign up to my software. But in general, let's just get to know each other. Let's show you what's good. And I'm just, I love talking about this stuff. It was a really nice foundation for, for the call. So I think for sales, um, anybody going into this needs to be thinking that, particularly for SaaS, you're not bothered about a trial. You're bothered about long-term sales and even referrals. So if you're an early stage startup, think about how to really know what's that person's problem what they're going through, what's their situation, and how you can give them an experience where they really love you as a person, not just the product. A lot of people hide behind the product and say, it's not about me. Early stage, they buy from you, and then they start to say, well, okay, the product's cool, but I'm relying on you to help me use it, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's about gaining the trust of the person. And, and, and even sometimes it's even better to, like you talk about the example of the podcast equipment. It could be better just to, just to provide value without anything to do with your yeah. product. You connect them with somebody, they, hey, maybe you're looking for a podcast guest and there's a couple of people I can recommend. Like it could be something that, yeah. that is not connected at all. And that's exactly. a relationship. Yeah, I think um, the, the problem is, I think people, it's, it's a really good phrase. I remember it's, it's the best alternative really, or it went in sales, it's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So there's this word called back there, which is really important. If you're in sales and you're really pushy, really desperate, and you've got no plan B, the plan A, you go crazy. It's, I try and say it a lot in relationships. If you're single and you, you go on one date and that's all you've got lined up, one of the problems is you text a hundred times, can't wait to see you, can't, and although you've got a good intentions, you scare the person away. If, however, you played a bit cool and you've got other options, 
you'd be less crazy. Now, I'm not really touching on relationships here, but when it comes to sales, if you've only got one option, you turn nuts. You think only about this company. You keep chasing them up. If you've got a few other options, that company will say, now is not the right time. You say, no bother, take it easy. If that's the only other option, you'll be really pushy, hustling, chasing them. So the reason I like lead generation is to make sales for me fun. I don't put massive pressure on they've got to sign up. I put pressure on to say, can I fill the amount of people who want to speak to me? And then I just have fun. I chat to them, show them the product, see how I can help, see if I can introduce them. But I think if everybody had this mentality of just saying, how can I help you? I would, And I even say to some people, I would love you to use my software. I would love to sell it to you. But how can I help you? What do you actually need? And a lot of time people say, well, I don't even need a LinkedIn software. I'm looking at email. And I do the full talk just on introducing stuff. Because I, I see two things. I think as a salesperson, if you're getting better and better at every call, just look at it as a practice script. So every 30 minutes, I'll say, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to do a demo or do, do something else and constantly reiterate and get better. So even if I haven't made a sale, that 30 minutes, I've just trained on selling. So that's good enough for me. Um, I think some sales manager will be a bit angry if the sales team will be like, I've made no sales, but I'm, I'm practicing, I'm practicing. <laughs> they might be angry. But I think if you're a startup and you're, you're a founder doing your own sales, practice every call to say what's, what's getting better, what's easy, and what's helping you. But the, the one sentence I think is critical for that is a very good TED talk. And there's just this line to say, tell me more. If anybody in the world speaks to you and tells you something, just say, wow, that's amazing. Tell me more. They just open up. So uh, like you could just say, tell me more 100 times today. And I could tell you tons of stories because <laughs> it's just that sentence, tell me more. So I find this fascinating when you're speaking to a customer and they say, oh, um, how's the weather? Oh, it's terrible. Really tell me more. Then they go into detail. Well, I'm stuck in ice. My kids couldn't travel. I'm stuck here working at home. It's freezing. And it doesn't go to a sales call. It goes into just breaking the ice. And then you transition into, so this is what I do and this is how I do it. But you've got that bond from stranger to something. So if you're going to remember any of the rubbish I talked about today, it's just that line, tell me more. <laughs> that will help you a lot. Wow, that's amazing, Patrick. Uh, tell me more. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's all you need. You're, you should change the show to the tell me more. It's a sty and bot. That is interesting. Tell me more. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, tell me more. Just, just a picture of myself and like maybe my mouth is just like opening like this. Amazing. Patrick, I just love this uh, this advice. I'm going to check out the TED talk. We're, we're going to post it in the comments after the show. Yeah. Um, Patrick, you mentioned mentality. What are some of the like top three advice you would recommend early stage founders when it comes to building the right mindset, growth mindset? Yeah. Um, it's a strange one because a lot of people will talk about mental toughness, about drive, that sort of thing. Um, but to me, I'm not so sure that's the right one. I think one of them has to be creativity. I think you need to find a way to keep enjoying what you're doing. So If you hit a block for whatever reason, you need to find a fun way to look at it as a different angle and say, how do we solve this? So anything that I have, I don't think we're screwed. I think, okay, stop, evaluate, how do I fix this? And more of the game is how do you fix the problem? So sales, product, hiring, whatever it is, nothing goes smoothly. So you have to find a way to be creative. So I think one of them is this either creativity or this energy to not be um, knocked too much. And I think if you're completely at a level, it's not good. You need to have the big highs, the big lows to, to really keep going. But you need to have the energy to say, um, I can do this, I can keep going. So it's that internal drive to, to want to do something. Um, the other one is you need to have an amazing support bubble. So it's not just about who are you as a person, it's about who's surrounding you. So when I'm at my strongest, it's because I have my wife who I run the business with and she's my she's my rationale she's the moderation in me so i'll have a huge idea and she'll say that's a good idea for next year get back to work okay good but without her i would have probably built that idea 10 times and and bust and homeless and all sorts because she she balances my personality and then you have other friends who have nothing to do with work and it'd just be like sending me youtube videos go for beer or something but you need to have different people in your support bubble that help you with different things 
I'm very lucky that I've got a, a family of brothers, sisters, cousins that were on chat all the time. That's nothing linked to business. So the idea is you have a, I have a bubble that's outside of work. I have my family, I have chat, but different parts of my brain are stimulated in different ways. So I would say that the energy to keep dry, driven is very important. And I think the, the support bubble around you to say you are not a single founder, even if it's a single founder business, your business will only thrive with the people around you to support you. And that can be coaches, consultants, friends, but different people. Um, I think the third one, and, um, and it's like two Ps, it's proactive and it's pushy. Um, and if you want to have the third one, it's polite, these sorts of three Ps. Um, I say to everybody, um, if you can be proactive and pushy, it's good. If you can be proactive, pushy and polite, I love it. So the idea behind this is that, say we do this talk and you were a startup and I'd say, yeah, I can definitely introduce you to somebody. Proactive would be, um, great, who is it? Pushy would be emailing me to say, Pat, thanks for the introduction. Um, can you make the intro? And polite is just being nice about doing it. I really appreciate the intro. This is going to mean a lot to me. If I can buy you a beer, say thanks, just let me know. Proactive, pushy, polite. So if you put them together, basically they're constantly hustling and pushing and doing what they need but the person on the other side wants to do more for them. So you'll have met somebody where you'll have helped them out and you felt amazing by doing something good for them. Um, and it's this person who has the personality who makes you feel like you want to help them. So you could call it basic manners, or I don't know what it is, but there's a few startups where they'll say, we're looking to hire, I'll introduce them to somebody. I'll never hear from them again. And I'll check the LinkedIn profile and they've hired somebody like, buy me a beer, send me a coffee. I had one development agency once who I made an intro, they signed up a big deal and they sent me a pair of AirPods. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like you just said, thanks. Like it's not bribery because you paid me like afterwards. It's more like just gratitude. And it's very rare anybody does that. They ask for a favor, but they don't thank you afterwards and just do a small act. So I would say that final one is pushy, polite and proactive, put them all together. Somebody makes an intro, somebody says thanks, somebody says I can help you with something, just say when. Not, okay, cool, when. Okay, let's do it. And they, they make it happen. And you'll see the style, and there's certain characters who'll be the thinkers and the, the, there's the ones that are the doers. And I think the startups are the doers who just instantly, um, you give them some advice, they look into it, they read it, they question it, they ask for intros, and they make you feel good about it as they're asking you. <laughs> that, that's the like. That's the people that I like to work with. Yeah, and in, in many ways, people sometimes say, I'm stuck. I don't know what decision to take. In many ways, action is the solution. Yeah. Of course, you want to get advice. Of course, you want to see, especially some with some important decisions. But usually, when you start taking action, you can you can kill procrastination. Yeah. You can, you can really improve your focus if you have this mentality towards we're doing stuff, we're trying things, we're experimenting. We are not afraid to make mistakes on the way because we will, yeah. no matter what. Yeah. And speed is important. Yeah. So um, I think I think this is applicable to not just startups, but any business. So um, the speed to want to make something happen. Um, so there's one team I'm working with, the start wise guys, they're having a bit of a tough time. So I said, okay, next week you come into my office for a day and we leave when everything is set up. All your campaigns, we'll write a blog post, we'll set up messages, you're gonna do some demos, you leave when we're done. And you'll be amazed that you'll probably get a month's worth of work done in a day because we're committed to a day. So I think this whole idea of, I think it's Parkinson's law where given a lot of amount of time, things will get done in that amount of time. And I think when you give people sort of boundaries to say you have targets and you have a time limit, people achieve incredible things. So I think these are the characters who are sort of pushy with how they make things happen, but they're making them happen within a framework. And that's very, very important. The people who are busy for the sake of busy sort of say, we're working hard, we're not getting anywhere, but we're working hard. Although you sort of feel good, it's not impressing anybody, it's not getting anywhere. So you have to have definitely the mentality of working hard, but it needs to fit in a boundary of saying, I'm gonna work crazy and I'm gonna do 100 calls today, but then I'm going to evaluate and say, was it worth it? Were those results good? And if they weren't very good, I'm going to try 100 LinkedIn messages a day. That's a smart approach. But the not smart approach is I'm going to do 100 calls a day every day because I'm working hard. And you get to the end of the month and think, I could have just won one blog post and got more customers. So you've got to have hard and smart and try and mix them together. But for early stage startups, the, the biggest problem is they don't push that hard enough at all. They don't say, I've been going hardcore for calling and it didn't work for us. They just say, presume calling won't work. I was like, how do you know? Just 
just try it even a couple of days and you know definitely agree with this and <laughs> and we had a lot of conversations uh, with other guests as well about uh, especially tech founders their inability to focus on reaching out customers early stages like they're a lot more focused on let's build a product and yeah. then we'll talk to the customers and see if they like it and so on so uh, but also in terms of execution of mm. actually the when you set yourself a really specific goal and and like maybe this stretch number that you need to reach you'll be amazed how much you can produce uh, yeah. like you have three days to reach a certain thing and then you set the really clear deadline and you have to do it no matter what yeah. you get on it you get it done and you're like wow i could be yeah. so productive man why but, am i but, not so productive all the time but this is the point so if you say to a startup founder um have you been a university yes did you write a degree yes how long did it take to write your degree the month before it was due okay are you running a startup now yes are you got sales targets yes how long is it going to take to hit your targets one year what about if you give yourself a month oh it's not possible and then they have a month target and then guess what they hit it because they give themselves a time frame and say that has to be it so this whole idea is a lot of people have already experienced this phenomenon of you have not much time and somehow you find a way you've got an exam tomorrow so somehow you do six hours of revision when you're exhausted and then you do the exam but if the exam was next year you wouldn't have done six hours a day till next year you would have waited the night before so the point is with this productivity you give yourself a time frame to say i'm going to hit targets by a certain date and then figure out how i'm going to make it happen so one thing i've done this year that's been a little different other years is i always have goals and targets revenue targets i have some targets for running as in i would love to run a half marathon a marathon but the one target i've done this month is break it down all into monthly goals instead of yearly the weight I'm going to be, what my bank balance will look like, what my running training will be looking like, what vitamins I'm going to be looking like. So I can see, I keep checking every day and say, am I on track today with where I want to be? And the reason I'm doing this is so many times I've thought, I really want to lose a bit of weight. And I go hardcore for two weeks and then I stop because there's no sort of big picture. It's just like, go, 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 go. And then I lose, lose sort of faith. I lose time. So what I've realized is that I need small and consistent goals for the full year of like everything I'm doing and then just enjoy the ride as I'm going. So if I have goals and I've them set, I find everything like a game. How do, you, how do you beat the game? How do you stay ahead of the numbers? But I find too many startups in particular have no goals. They'll say, we want to get to 10,000 MRR. And I'll say, okay, so how many say, customers is this? 100. How many demos is this? 300. How many leads? 800. So you need to get 800 leads in three months. Yes, not realistic. And they're like, actually, this isn't going to happen. So I, I worked with one team this month who thought they were going to do 600 demos in a month. And I was like, 600 demos, 30 minutes a day. Like, where are these numbers coming from? So you need to make sure that as any startup, you're setting goals, not just of end goal, but activity goals. Um, how many leads, how many demos, how many customers, how many trials? And then how am I going to make those happen? And then you have a chance. But unrealistic goals of just end revenue to keep investors happy just doesn't help you. You need small and, and consistent, uh, I don't know, growth goals. And I just want to say hello to to uh, Eva, who's tuning in, uh, saying hi. And <laughs> uh, she apparently she enjoys your 3P concept of pushing proactive and polite. Uh, <laughs> If any of you guys on the live stream are having any question to Patrick, we'll take a couple of questions by the end. So uh, please make sure to, to post a question. Patrick, you started yeah. speaking about um, focus, productivity, and uh, setting goals. And I'm actually curious, what is your process? You mentioned yeah. monthly goals, but can you maybe tell us like what exactly, how many goals do you set? How often do you sit together? Like, do you have your weekly process to make sure you track and measure them? Like really yeah. the practically... How do you set goals from yearly to quarterly to monthly to weekly? What's your so process? So I'll go through my goals and what is working and what's nowhere near. So one of the goals I have is food. Um, it seems simple, but if I have to think about food, um, I'll not eat. I'll not have time. I'll eat rubbish or something. So first thing I've done this year is I make meal plans for the week ahead. Breakfast, snack, dinner, snack, dinner, um, or lunch, dinner. And then I'll leave saturday night and sunday night to say let's have something nice but i plan all the food and then on sunday my wife and i buy all the ingredients make it together 
and that's it. So I know tonight I'm eating this food. It sounds really boring, but if the food you make is nice, you're more ready for it. So imagine I get back tonight, I'm exhausted, it's eight o'clock. If I have to think what I'm gonna make, I'll not make something healthy. I'll make whatever's quick in the fridge. So we committed to this plan of say, we're gonna eat healthy. We might have burgers or something at the weekend, but Monday to Friday, we eat really healthy and we stick to a plan. So that was one thing about making meal plans and every Sunday afternoon, refreshing it a bit and saying, what did I like? What did I change? But one was a meal plan. Um, the other one is health. So what is my support? section for how I stay healthy. So what vitamins am I taking? What supplements am I taking? Um, can I get a massage? Can I meditate? Can I do all the things that keep me healthy and active? Um, I would say this year, I am on another level of what I've been last year of just raw energy. And like, it'll be 10, 11 at night, and I'll be fighting, jumping, thinking like, what's happening here? And I, I put it down to two things. One is I think having a baby. A lot of people say a baby will tie you out. But I think it's the opposite. When you like you hug a baby for and the baby hugs you, you get this endorphin boost of just like boom, like I'm ready to go. So I think having a, a baby, like I'll do a couple of calls, hug her, come back. It's like a top up that I don't know. It, it is the 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 drug of whatever it is that makes you happy. But that endorphin is way more powerful than anything else. So I think that's boosting me a lot. And um, the supplement I shared with you before called Fortivitum, I think, is awesome. So. It's fortivitum.lt or fortivitum.com, I think it is. And, and this is a spray, but it's a vitamin spray. So there's one for vitamin D, vitamin B12. Um, the other one is for sleeping. There's a CBD spray. There's a multivitamin spray. And basically, I have them lined up. So I brush my teeth, spray a couple, and then I'm done. So the, the way of getting healthy vitamins into me never used to work with tablets. I would have a drink, a tablet, I would forget to drink it, I would forget to take it, like it's rubbish. So having these sprays means I've got a lot more healthy vitamins in me. And I think particularly vitamin D at the moment with COVID going around um, is a really important thing to be taking a lot of, or even in January in, in the dark and the snow, it's good for that. So that's sort of vitamins. And then I have my business goals. So my business goals are really clear for my own software of the amount of leads I need, the amount of demos I need, the amount of sales, the amount of trials, and the amount of customers on a monthly basis. That's all going perfectly, everything directly to plan. So that's the good side so far. Then I have my weight. And what I decided this month or this year was to say, I'm going to just say what my weight's going to be this Christmas next year, something I'll get really excited about. Um, and then I just plan every month what that's going to be look like. The one thing that's going terribly is my morning routine. So I read um, a lot of different books. The 5 a.m. club was a good one and different things. This idea of getting up early, having a, a killer two hours before you start work, training, reading, different things. I tried it for a couple of days and I was just angry by like 11 o'clock. I was tired, I was hungry, I wasn't motivated. And, and it was just because um, I, I build energy as the day goes. So. I wake up about seven and if my daughter's not awake, I go back to sleep because I need to sleep while she's asleep. <laughs> but so I get go back to sleep, eight o'clock, maybe I wake up. But what I'm finding is that it's 10, 11 o'clock and I'm on a laptop and I need to stop simply because it's late, not because I'm tired or anything else to be sociable. I think I need to stop working. But my energy levels are like increasing throughout the day. So out of all my goals I've set, the main thing I've learned is monthly goals is really important, but iterate a little bit. Um, I don't need to get up seven in the morning to say, hey, I'm this cool person who wakes up at six and is online. If it doesn't work for me, just, just stop. It. Um, and then the final thing is I think this book I really like, I was talking to you about it, um, that one of you can see, Productivity Planner. So a lot of people will be surprised because I'm a tech obsessed. So I'll automate, I'll have systems, dashboards, everything. But to get shit done is a notebook. And the reason why is because it's one page it's not creative, it's, it fits on the page, high to low, it's just what's the most important thing to some of the things that need to be done. And then it's weekly accountability as well. So at the moment in Lithuania, it's so cold, on a January, like at a Sunday afternoon, I'll put the fire on, be at a table, open my book up, and just see what did I not get done this week? Did I start a YouTube channel? Did I start an online course? Did I start the things I was going to do? And if not, I cross it off and it's sort of, crossing it as I do it hurts me inside it's like a cross tick box no part you've let yourself down you've let me down you've let your family down <laughs> it's this mentality of I don't want to untick a box so and then I review and say okay what do I need to do next week 
So a lot of things, but I'm goal driven crazy just to have boundaries to stay a, a little bit ahead of the goals each month. That's what I try and do. Yeah, and I, and I can definitely see the positive effect on having a structured notebook. Uh, you know, some people are using, I think the same company, the five minute journal to yeah. kind of start the day strong. Um, as we discussed before, before the stream, specifically this, this planner doesn't really fit my own planning, you know, structure. So, so what, what was wrong? What, what was out of your day that I, was I wrong? Think I've done it, I think I've done it. Uh, it was like a couple of years ago for a few days. Uh, but I have a very specific process of um, planning my week and planning my day. That's kind of going through these five steps. What I didn't have in, in this specific notebook, uh, the productivity planner is, is an opportunity to kind of break my top objectives down with sub sub goals. Yeah. And, and it was a little bit too simple and not fitting my own system. So At the same time, I really see the, the benefit for, for, for many people. With, well, uh, I was going to say, if you've written perform, surely the next step is to create the productivity planner, your version, like an actual it is, book. It is yeah. It's on the list. It is on the list. In the next three Good. months, we're going to have a notebook connected to to perform. So uh... it, it makes sense. I think the reason they've done well is it feels like a, a moleskin book. It doesn't feel like something else. It feels like a really nice. So physically looking, it's the. I, I love it, man. It, it I looks love the good. Design. I love the design that, like the way it's structured. The you know the in interior design. The the skin is like it's it's just nice. Yeah, it's nice to touch. But but again, it just doesn't fit my own planning methodology I'm, I'm sure it works really well for many people and highly yeah. recommend people you know this is good yeah there's yeah. so much destruction there's so well, much destruction out there putting things on paper and making sure these are my these are my top objectives i need to get done these results today that's it yeah and I, that's, sure. it's hugely important the problem with software is you can hide the screen you can switch it off you can have software on top of software on top of software when you have something like this it's that's your page for today if you want to turn it over, whatever, but that's your page where you work through it, tick it off or not. And so the, the reason I like this is I, I read a book about just how different uh, creators are creating sort of new mockups and new ideas. And they don't design on software. They design on a paper, A4 paper as a quick sketch because it's got boundaries. You can't go above this. You can't do unlimited pages. It's create your idea on that page. Looks good. Okay, build it. So having the boundaries of a bit of paper to say, that's my plan for today, you don't go off on building new companies, you write a few to-do lists because it's it's actionable items. So I think everybody's different in terms of how they do it, but too much software can um, almost distract you from just saying just a simple to-do list you can take on the world if you have a big plan and then a little plan and you keep checking it off. I think that's the, that's the point. And we have another comment from Yeva. Yeva, thank you for tuning in and being with us today. So true about food, she says. Preparation really helps in productivity while working. Crucial for me as well. Health and sport, another top issue on my priority list. And, and I really want to thank you, Patrick, for, yeah. for pointing out when we talk about goals and stuff like that, how important it is to think about food, think about uh, our mental state and think about uh, all these basics. At the yeah. beginning of this conversation, we talk about the, how do we set the basics, the operational system. And, and a lot of these are things that um, also we talk a lot about that uh, in the book with, uh, with Cristobal, the Perform book. You have to take care of yourself. Mm. It's the first thing. Yes, you have a lot of work to do. Yes, you have to be focused. You, you need to produce results and maybe you will be working long hours. But that's not an excuse not to take care of your nutrition, your yeah. exercise your mental health, all these things that will not only make you feel better, but they will help you to perform better. Of course. But it's all preparation. So a lot of people will say, I eat healthy when I have time to eat healthy. Otherwise, I grab whatever. And the problem is you always have time at different things. Everybody has time at a weekend to do something. So like there's a whole movement of batch planning. You make 20 dishes, put it in a fridge, and then each day you grab things. You can have a lot of fun, even in a relationship you do with your partner where you cook these meals together, you have a bit of fun, and then every day you're just grabbing things. But this whole idea of trying to, like if you drink when you're thirsty, it's too late. If you eat when you're hungry, it's too late. You need to be constantly prepared that step ahead. So I think if you've got a high pressure job or you're very, very busy, 
just look at the different points of the day, what you need, prepare it the night before, and then try it. And you'll be amazed the momentum you build of um, the speed you have. You don't think about things. You don't worry about things. You just, you know you're eating this. You know you're drinking this, and you get going. The other big thing, people don't drink enough water. Like, my mother's the worst for this. She'll she'll drink coffee all day, but I say, just have a glass of water. <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay. Like, drink tons and tons of water. If you're in a position like us two where we speak a lot, you've got to drink a huge, a huge amount of water. So a lot of people, it was very funny, I read something and say most people take a paracetamol because they've got a headache. So they drink water to go with the paracetamol. But it's the water that gets rid of the headache, not the paracetamol. <laughs> so just one thing there is like drink more water. It makes sense. <laughs> This is so cool. By the way, your mom is awesome. Uh, we met uh, previously. She's prior, amazing. Prior Corona, we met uh, yeah in Turkey. Uh, and so and she's, she, she's cool. She's what starts the 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 all the P's. So not just about that. She talks about pronunciation, about passion. Like there's a there's a full talk on all the P's. But those are the three P's that that stands for for my sort of approach. And Patrick, we mentioned uh, I mentioned mental health, uh, but. Uh, now you've been working specifically the last 12 months a lot with different startups with uh, other size companies um how do you feel about uh, this whole situation you know a lot of people were forced in some way to work from home yeah they, some some teams were not prepared for this uh, remote way of working and and not just the working part but people not being able to socialize to to meet other human beings to to go to social gatherings to get out of house you know not to mention people who are actually you know having a, a loved one being uh, yeah. having covid and those kind of things how do you think and you know maybe your personal advice from your experience and from the people around you what would be your recommendations for for people who are struggling with this situation you know maybe some some practical tools to 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 be uh to get back on track or to yeah. to, to kind of really well, this the, the first thing is just be realistic it totally sucks so don't be one of these people that said it's cool it's fine i'm rolling with it it's all good i'm finding a way like yes be very positive so you have to be positive but be a realist realist to say this is a terrible situation that you shouldn't have to adapt to. So one word that really frustrates me is a lot of people say it's a new normal. It's like it's not. The old normal will come back. The world's different and it will change to a lot of online stuff. But the old normal will come back where I hug my friend, I get drunk with my friend, we have a great time. That's never going to be replaced by an online Zoom chat. So the, one of the points are be passionate about what you did used to love and what's coming back. So I think for me, I get down sometimes thinking, geez, I would love to just have a party, like just go crazy, meet up with loads of friends, drink, dance, be stupid. Like I miss that let loose sort of thing. But I'm not worried because it's coming. Like if it's in a month, if it's six months, if it's a couple of years, like life is very, very good because we're live and we're here. Now, I know there's lots of different things happening, but I think the main thing is patience more than anything. Um, I think... It's different to your own personality and to your business outlook, which are two different things. But your own personality, if you're alive, if you're here and you are breathing and living and sleeping, just be patient. Just think, I can't wait till I can party, till I can go on holiday, can I go shopping, whatever it is you're thinking. But have that attitude instead of the down of, I'm missing all these things, so I'm upset. Just be more interested. Like, I can't wait to go to Zara and pair, buy a pair of jeans. It sounds so stupid, but I hate online shopping. So that little thing of going at the weekend and going shopping, probably the next couple of weeks in Lithuania when lockdown finishes, I'm just looking forward to doing that. But there's there's certain things where you have to be positive on an outlook, but be realistic that you shouldn't have to adapt and say, this is the new world. It's not. The new world is people adapting to online, but always valuing face-to-face -face contact because we're social animals and that's never going to change. So... I think that's one thing. The other thing is routines. Um, if you're working from home, there are some really stupid routines. I've got two pairs of slippers. I have work slippers and home slippers. When I finish work, I change slippers. Sounds ridiculous, but my mental thing, like I live with my wife, I'm, I'm in my office. I go back into my bedroom, I change clothes. I, I shout, honey, I'm home. And we take the like the piss or whatever. But it's, it's what we do because it's like nine o'clock, eight o'clock. I say, honey, I'm home, I've changed my slippers. And I sort of switch because one thing that's really important is that life and work are not a blur. 
work, I love what I do, but it's not everything about me. So you need to find that way to divide. And if that's two pairs of slippers, if that's wearing trousers for work and shorts at nighttime, mentally find the cue which say, this is not work anymore. And for me, it's simply what I wear. If I'm wearing a suit or something, I'm going into meetings. If I'm tracks with bottoms, I'm chilled. But I would never wear tracks with bottoms for a day work because my mind is saying you're not in work mode. So to me, I just wear different clothes, change different things, and try and snap out of it. Um, I think the other thing, though, is be vulnerable. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is just saying, I'm not good. I'm not happy. I'm upset. They feel like that's a weakness that uh, they're letting somebody down. And the problem is, particularly if you're in an environment, a company, you're expecting somebody to be at their best. And if they're not, you need to know about it to know how to help them. So it's more of a weakness not telling people than a weakness of, of telling people. So you have to just say to somebody, look, I'm struggling, I'm burnt out, I'm bored, I'm tired, I'm whatever, what do we do? And there's, or there's always somebody smarter than you to speak to, which is interesting. So there's always somebody to say how to eat better, how to sleep better, how to whatever. But the first part is you saying, I'm not okay and I need a bit of help. And a lot of people um, are struggling with that. One other big thing that I think is huge is if anybody new is joining your company with new energy, make sure that you don't just keep the same energy that's been. So I found with Wise Guys, I joined like full time in September. And my enthusiasm is attack, let's party, let's full of energy. They'd already had a year of adapting to be on online. So I was just another person in the online mix. And I said, this is not good enough. I want online Zumba. I want online parties. I want online stuff. I want more because it's not acceptable for me, even if that's been the new normal, that that's an acceptable normal. We need to do what we can. So I think the final part of that is just find something to be stupid. If people don't realize how important it is to do something stupid. So wise guys, I've got in an hour's time, we've got bring your pets and we've got a Zoom call where you share your pets. Productivity zero, but the emotion of feeling close to your team, one million percent. We did Z uh, Zumba dancing. We did, I learned the Vogue dance, the Madonna Vogue dance. That was pretty good. So doing these things have an enormous effect of just making you feel like, life's not so tough. It's okay. I can get to another day. And that's the whole thing. So I think in general, don't underplay how bad this situation is. It's unheard of. And if you look back at this in a couple of years, you'll just think, wow, what even happened there? But you'll also look back in a couple of years and say, it's no longer happening. Life's cool. And I'm going to do something about it. So be positive. I think keep driving on and find that bubble around you that will get you through this, what we hope is the next six months. I don't think it's any longer than that, but I hope it's the next six months. I'm really hoping as well and, and definitely <laughs> absolutely agree with what you're saying that we cannot ignore what's going on. Yes, it's it's really difficult. It's really difficult for many people in many different aspects and we should not try to say, oh, everything is positive and, and rainbow and sunshine because it's not. Mm. At the same time though, accepting this, accepting that, talking about productivity, maybe you, the listener, you may not be at your... 100% productive. Maybe you wake up, you're feeling sad, down, depressed. I don't know what it is. That's fine. Own it. Mm. Own it. But but then you have the responsibility to say, can I can I keep my focus still on some things that are in my control? Can yeah. I do something fun and invite people to a Zumba call or like do something fun for, for my team? Can I what can I do to actually go through this? difficult situation can can i do yeah. something fun at home and as you said with the slippers i think it's a it's an exceptional example uh, yeah so, people uh, laugh a lot but it's so hardcore like change slippers change mindset change work or something it, it's like it, it's it's my genius advice that at least helps me <laughs> but it, it's it's it is important to be stupid um there, i spoke to one start a very early stage and i said how did you adapt and they simply said once a week we have a team call where you're not allowed to talk about work that's it and it's really easy, but if you think about the Zoom mentality now, everything is scheduled. We're going to have a call at 10 and we have an agenda, but the agenda should be do nothing, but at least have a bit like, so what this team does is say 10 till 11, Friday morning, we can't talk about work. And if somebody mentions work, they are kicked off the call. So it's, it's really good, but it's just like having an environment which you need to have the small talk. And 
if you can find that, I think I'm lucky with Stopwise guys where they're all personalities who know how to adapt. They've got very good personal skills as well as getting getting stuff done. But I think if you're in an environment where everything is, is really struggling, find people a way. Like every time I do a webinar, I get people to clap and cheer. It just It just wakes them up and it just feels like you're a little bit more social than just, okay, now I'm presenting, that sort of thing. So find a way to just get people to get out of the comfort zone a bit. And with, with you starting, particularly when you do your physical events, it's the one session out of all of them where people actually jump, do press-ups, meditate, do music. It's something that shakes them out of the norm that they get so much power from it. And if you're not doing that and everything's the same of just work, it's just dull. So you need to find a way to just be a bit silly sometimes. And if you can get your bosses to be a bit silly, it's like reciprocal that, wow, they're being silly, then this is this is like double fun, which is cool. And counterintuitively, yeah. this actually has a huge positive effect on the performance and the productivity afterwards mm. in the more longer term perspective. So uh, definitely something to for you guys who are listening to to maybe think about uh, to explore and think about what could be some things I might want to change if I'm not feeling um great because one thing it results another thing is how do we feel and how do people around us feel as well yeah and uh, so amazing topics uh patrick uh, since we we are going ahead uh, with the time right now i just wanted to uh, to thank you so much for being today at the show sharing so much practical advice positive energy <laughs> something that we all need uh, in these days where could people find you connect with you and hear more about what you do um, I think it's important to practice what I would preach. So if you Google Patrick Collins or Patrick Collins Startup Wise guys, uh, my LinkedIn profile should be the top thing that comes up. So um, I think connect with me on LinkedIn, first of all, say where you found out about me, get to know me and let me know how I can help you. Uh, my business is Prospect Labs, so prospectlabs.co, and that's a LinkedIn lead generation tool, or startupwiseguys.com, which is uh, one of the leading accelerators throughout Europe and I think if you're a startup uh, throughout the Baltics particularly there's going to be some states that our paths will cross even throughout Turkey Eastern Europe who knows but I think I'm always the go-to guy to say um, can I get a bit of advice can I get a bit of support and just try and drive you on so I hope um, my ramblings today have added some sort of positive side to you uh, but it's been a real reward for me just to be able to talk that's not always business related it's nice to, to share my voice on on what I do and how I live because I find my energy levels through the roof at the moment and if I can help other people be like that I think it's it's a nice skill to pass on. Hey, thank you so much Patrick I appreciate your mindset your energy and always your willingness to support and to help others so so really really grateful for for the opportunity to have you, you on the podcast and can't wait to actually have a, a really nice cup of coffee with you. Uh, We're gonna drink and party hard <laughs> not coffee we're gonna party hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll change my slippers and everything. Yeah, I'll wear my new party slippers and we'll do it. <laughs> Definitely. I'm going to get my party slippers. That's a, <laughs> that's a commitment now. So thank you so much. And thank everybody, uh, see you next time for Coffee and Productivity. Have a beautiful afternoon, evening, or morning, whenever you are listening right now. And uh, see you very soon for the next episode.